Welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I invite you to check out over 4,000 of my written reviews. You can read there anytime. Quipster.net is where to go. Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to click the link to my other podcast. It's called the Quipster Film Review Podcast, where I look at films that are brand new out in theaters. You can check out all of that information at my website. That's at Quipster.net. Today, I'm going to be continuing on the second part of my three-part series looking at Masters of Disguise in comedies of the 1980s. I looked at Fletch last week, and of course, what would make a more natural follow-up to Fletch than its sequel, which also came out in the 1980s. In 1989, to be specific, it is Fletch Lives. Of course, it brings back Chevy Chase as Fletch. It's a PG-rated film for sexual references, some violence, and language. I personally would rate this, like the first one, PG-13. Now, the PG rating was a little bit more liberal in 1985 when they were first starting it but pg-13 by this point should have incorporated fletch lives but nevertheless i would not show this to my seven-year-old an hour and 35 minutes is the runtime in addition to chevy chase you have hal holbrook arlie ermy julianne phillips cleavon little randall tex cobb and returning from the first film richard libertini and george weiner Director is, once again, Michael Ritchie, as with the first film, and the screenplay this time credited to Leon Capitanos. Now, this is an original sequel to the 1985 hit comedy Fletch. It was originally meant to be based on the sixth of Gregory McDonald's series of Fletch novels. That novel was called Fletch and the Man Who, and it had a plot that would involve Fletch becoming the press liaison for this campaign of the state governor who was in the race to become president of the United States. In fact, they, they had a script already done. They greenlit it before Fletch was even released into theaters. And the original credited screenwriter for Fletch, Andrew Bergman, had written it, called Fletch 2 at the time, and it was slated to have a release in the summer of 1986. They wanted to strike while the iron was still hot on the would-be franchise. Chevy Chase had already signed a three-picture deal at the time with Universal Pictures to appear as the titular character, so they were ready to go to make this a franchise. However, there were a number of delays that ended up pushing the film beyond its intended date, and that was primarily because Chevy Chase wanted... He started to get involved with his new production company called Cornelius Productions. By the way, Cornelius is Chevy's real first name. He wanted to have tighter control of the films he made and a lot more input, and he thought that Fletch 2 could be part of that umbrella. He ended up turning down Bergman's screenplay, and that resulted in a new script that was commissioned in 1986, to Walter Bernstein. Bernstein was someone who worked with director Michael Ritchie before on his 70s film called Semi-Tough. He would again work with Ritchie after this with The Couch Trip. By 1988, though, it was decided that that script by Bernstein needed to be overhauled, and veteran screenwriter Leon Capitanos was brought in. In this iteration of the screenplay, all of the stuff about politics was pushed out of the film. And in fact, any story at all about anything from a Gregory McDonald novel was not used. This new Capitano script would be about a shady televangelist. And the screenplay would have the title of Fletch Saved. Now, part of the inspiration for the film was due to the rampant news reports of the life and the crimes of televangelist Jim Baker and his wife, Tammy Faye. They hosted a popular faith-based TV ministry at the time called the PTL Club, and they ran a Christian amusement park called Heritage USA. All the while, they were living lavishly from the money that they brought in from the donations of their very sizable flock around the country. The other part of the inspiration comes from another televangelist called Peter Popoff. He was revealed to be a con man in 1986, where it was revealed that he received messages to him. He was wearing an earpiece, and his wife would use a radio transmitter to detail ailments among members of his audience that he, he would miraculously guess as he used his faith-healing techniques. However, Universal Pictures was unhappy with the proposed title of Fletch Saved. They felt that it might further offend people of faith because at that time, Universal Pictures was already getting hammered by Christian groups for its release of Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ, and they didn't want any more trouble. Michael Ritchie here returning as director with the new title of Fletch Lives, which was deemed to be a little bit safer. It's set primarily in Louisiana. 
And in addition to on the set, Universal Studios in Hollywood, where the famous tour offers up some aspects of the Bible Land theme park experience within the film, the flash flood portion of the Universal Studios tour would end up getting retooled to become the flood from Noah's Ark here. Now, the plot of the finished film involves Fletch quitting his job as an investigative reporter for the LA Times. He learned that he's inherited his aunt's expansive plantation estate in Louisiana. It's called Belle Isle. Unfortunately, he arrives to find that Belle Isle is completely run down through many years of lack of upkeep, and it's essentially pretty much worthless, but there are offers for the land itself from mysterious sources. When the executor of the will ends up dead in Fletch's bed, Fletch becomes the top suspect in the murder. He soon learns that the reason for foul play is likely because someone out there, he doesn't know who, desperately wants him off of the property. And the main suspect, he thinks, could be this local television evangelist named Jimmy Lee Farnsworth, played by Arlie Ermey. Farnsworth has plans for the land to expand his Bible-based theme park, and Fletch decides to put his nose for sleuthing to good use to try to get to the bottom of who wants the land bad enough to be willing to kill for it and why. Much more to the story than that, but this is a film that doesn't really run off of its plot. It runs off of the comedy that the plot produces. In addition to its satire and televangelists, Fletch Lives wants to double also as a spoof on films about the Old South, especially in regard to the days of slavery. Indeed, its poster is a direct satire to a famous one done for Gone with the Wind. Instead of Rhett Butler, you have Fletch lustily holding a woman. And you see at the bottom of the poster a painting of a plantation estate and fire burning in the background. Universal paid Disney for the rights also to use the song Zippity Doo Dah for the partially animated dream sequence that is famously in this film. It recalls Disney's movie, Song of the South. It was actually a very inexpensive purchase for them. Depending on where you read it, it was anywhere from a couple of hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. And the savings from what they originally thought that they were going to have to pay for that song allowed Universal to raise the production value of that sequence significantly, and they hired hundreds of choreographed extras to dance in that sequence, and they used that fully for promotional material extensively for the film. Fletch Lives, it's a film that's not without its merits, but I will say it has not aged as well as its predecessor in the mind of most fans of the character. The televangelist angle, while it may have been in the headlines quite a bit in the mid to late 1980s, it really seems less relevant to most viewers today. Many viewers are probably either unfamiliar with all of that or have long since forgotten the era of corruption with large-scale television ministries. The film is also rife with cartoonish stereotypes about the people and the lifestyle of those who live in the American South. You have KKK rallies, biker gangs, Civil War enthusiasts, coon hunters, Corruption everywhere, police and elected officials, all of that very much stereotypes of the American South. And while Fletch, the first film, ended up making fun of country club elites who sought only to do for self and they deserve to get their comeuppance, the persistent ridiculing of rural Southern Americans seems exceedingly stereotypical and mean-spirited in its approach here. And its dabbling into racial stereotypes does render many of its comic set pieces as in bad taste. Chevy Chase himself ended up despising a lot of what he was asked to do in this film, including his opening scenes in drag where he's dressed up as a maid. He claimed he looked nothing like a woman. He's six foot four, big bones and all that. He thought that it just did not pay off comedically. But the sequence did test well with preview audiences, enough for Universal Studios to insist that they be kept in the film despite Chase's actively seeking their removal. Beyond that, Chevy Chase was just not happy with the sequel at all, especially in having to don even more ridiculous costumes than the first time around in order to try to drum up laughs that required an inordinate amount of mugging on his part to try to produce. There was a major writer strike that erupted shortly after filming Fletch Lives began, so they ended up having to tighten their schedule, and they had far less time for redoing the scenes that allowed for funny improvisation like they did for the first film. Chase also could not rely on any revisions to the plot done from seasoned writers to hold the scenes together as cohesively as when he deviated from the first film, so he had to rely on revisions handed down to him by Michael Ritchie himself, who is not a very seasoned writer at all. Now, if Chase wasn't happy, it partially does come out in his performance, unfortunately. Fletch comes across as too detached. He's too unlikable in his sequel compared to the first film. He seems unhappy to be there. It's probably because Chase wasn't happy to be there. His playful jabs come off more like punches to the face in this film 
In one of the film's biggest bad taste moments, Fletch switches the ailment of one of the flock in the audience of uh, the televangelist. He changes it to a gambling addiction instead of the actual ailment of being a lifelong hemorrhoid sufferer. So when the televangelist gets told in his earpiece that he has a gambling addiction, he just innocently tells him to expose his troubles for all of the audience to see. He insists on him doing it, and then, of course, the pants drop because he's going to show everybody his hemorrhoids, I guess. The original Fletch was playful and only served comeuppance to those who truly deserved it. But here, as evidenced in that scene, Fletch sees everyone as a potential victim for his smartassery. Fletch is smug, he's crass, he's mean, he feels like the entire world needs to be mocked mercilessly. Even the sweet and southern woman with whom he's bedded for the evening doesn't get a lot of sympathy when he finds her. He thinks that his prowess in bed was enough to kill her. That's part of the joke, I suppose. Ha ha. The supporting cast, like the first film, is full of pretty good character actors here. Hal Holbrook, Arlie Ermey, Cleavon Little, they're all very good actors to put in your film. Unfortunately for Cleavon Little, a lot of the movie requires him to play this very broad stereotype of an uneducated and dirt poor black man in the South that has not been seen on the screen for decades. By the end of the film, you realize that it's mostly just an act, but You know, if you think about that, that kind of makes it more unpalatable to contemplate that a modern black man would assume the identity of someone named Calculus Entropy, a seemingly slave-era black man speaking broken English because he expects that's the way he has to fit in in Louisiana of the 1980s. Seems kind of ridiculous, even for its era. The makers of the film seem to assume that as long as they make fun of racists in some parts of the film, that they can play up all of the racist jokes in the rest of the film and get away with it in fun. But it is dispiriting to have Fletch even engage in the racist jokes. He tells the plantation handyman calculus that he he should pick a bale of cotton after he ends up fixing things around the house. Another bad taste moment there. Model actress Julianne Phillips, she was in the middle of a messy divorce with Bruce Springsteen at the time. She does offer the requisite love interest in real estate agent Becky Culpepper, but she seems to lack the same chemistry with Chevy Chase that was more evidenced in the first film with the Gail Stanwyck character there. In fact, there's no explanation offered as to why Fletch is no longer with Gail Stanwyck in this picture. Harold Faltermeyer is brought back to do the score. However, I do think that nothing new or notable results because the soundtrack is basically just Harold Faltermeyer interpolating the same songs that he composed for the first film. Now, by removing the character of Fletch not only from his source material in Gregory McDonald's novels, but also much of who he was in the first film, I think the makers of Fletch Lives make the mistake here of thinking that all of our enjoyment of Fletch as a character comes from seeing him put on a bunch of disguises. I mean, we see a retread of the the Gordon Liddy character that he did in Fletch. This time, he's named Billie Jean King. He concocts funny names, you know, Elmer Fudd, Robert E. Lee, Nostradamus, Henry Himmler, and he ridicules everyone around him. And that's basically the gist of what we get regurgitated here from the first film. While Chevy Chase does deliver a consistently good performance in many regards, even in Fletch Lives, I don't think it's enough to make up for the fact that there really is not much fun to be had in seeing Fletch inherit a plantation house in Louisiana, ending up kicking up a lot of gross mischaracterizations of Southern living as a result. Although Fletch Lives has been largely viewed today as a franchise killer, it did actually have relatively decent numbers at the box office. It debuted at number one in its initial week of release, and it retained that spot for an additional week. It racked up nearly $40 million worldwide on a budget of only $8 million. That was a lower overall take than the first film, but it was still good money for Universal, despite the lackluster critical write-ups that mostly ripped the film for its adherence to cliches and this plot that it seems to barely care about. But despite that, Chevy Chase does deliver funny characterizations, and he does have witty moments, enough to suggest that the film is probably better than its reputation would suggest, but it's still a sizable step down from the delights of the first Fletch. So all in all, I think Fletch 2, or Fletch Lives as it would come to be called, is an okay movie, but not quite good enough for me to recommend to most people. I would say only really diehard fans of Fletch who want to give it another chance here may adopt it. If you're a big fan of Chevy Chase, obviously you'll probably end up giving it a watch. There are some people that do like it, but very few people that would consider this anywhere close to the delights of the first film. So a misfire, I would say, two and a half stars on my scale, meaning that it is a film that had all of the tools and talent to be a movie that I could recommend, but it just can't quite get it all together. I think it was hampered by that writer strike, and it also should not have deviated to begin with from the Gregory McDonald material 
it just went in a different direction that nobody really wanted it to go and it could never get its footing. So two and a half stars out of four is what I'll give Fletch. Now you could jump off here, but I do want to talk about some background material to this because the Fletch series, the Fletch franchise, if you prefer, was something that was going to continue on after Fletch Lives, but for a variety of reasons, it didn't get into that. So from a historical standpoint, I do want to continue talking about where the franchise went and where it went wrong after Fletch 2. So you can either jump off now or you can, if you're interested in finding out what happened to Fletch and why it stopped here, you can listen to what I have to say because it took a long time. It took me many, many hours to compile all of the information together to talk about here. Now, Universal did have plans to follow up with a third Fletch film, but it did have issues with Chevy Chase himself because of his personality, and he's just a difficult actor to work with for some people, and that resulted in them mutually separating professionally. The closest that Universal came to making a film would come in 1997, so about eight years after Fletch lives. They were courting Kevin Smith, to make a project with them, and they asked him what he would like to work on for the studio. He responded he would like to make Fletch 3. And so they decided, well, they were out of the Chevy Chase business, but they were willing to give it a shot. Kevin Smith ended up initially having lunch with Chevy Chase to talk about the possibility of reprising his role, whether as an older Fletch who's reminiscing about his early days with another actor playing the young Fletch role in Flashback, or there would be a Son of Fletch film set in the modern day where he, Chevy Chase's Fletch, ends up passing the torch to a younger Fletch, that would be his son, and they they were discussing ideas about what they could do with this new film. Kevin Smith had a notion that Chevy Chase could be the narrator, and he could appear at the beginning and end of the film in more of a supporting role. Joey Lauren Adams was considered to play Fletch's daughter, and Jason Lee as her love interest and eventually would be his son-in-law. Or it could have been the other way around. He could have played Fletch's son, and then Joey Lorraine Adams would end up being his daughter-in-law. But either way, Goldie Hawn was supposed to make a cameo appearance at some point, possibly as a mother to Joey Lorraine Adams. Shortly afterward, Kevin Smith ended up working on Dogma, and that became so controversial for him and so time-consuming to have to deal with the aftermath that his working on the script for Fletch 3 was put on the back burner. And unfortunately, by the time he got around to it again, Universal's option to make another Fletch film ended up expiring. But Kevin Smith was not dissuaded. He ended up hearing that the Fletch rights with Universal Pictures lapsed in the spring of 2000. So Kevin Smith ended up calling the bigwigs at Miramax about getting the rights, pitching his ideas on rebooting the franchise with one of the books called Fletch Who, that was the prequel novel in the McDonald series. Several other producers representing major studios had already been seeking out the rights, but none had been successful yet. So within a couple of days, Miramax came back with the rights to all of the Gregory McDonald Fletch novels, except for the original and the Flynn spinoffs. Reportedly, they paid about a mid-six-figure price to get the rights held for about five years in order to make a film. Kevin Smith figured that he could make the movie in the vein of Steven Soderbergh's Elmore Leonard adaptation of Out of Sight, and he thought he could either make it with Ben Affleck, which happened to be Harvey Weinstein's personal choice, or Jason Lee, which happened to be Kevin Smith's personal choice, to star as Fletch. They hoped that Chevy Chase would still be interested. He could play this older Fletch as part of the this narrator or envelope again, looking back at his younger self. But Chevy Chase ended up being so miffed about his experience in not hearing back from Kevin Smith for so many years that he flat out refused any participation after that because he thought he could have been making a Fletch film with somebody else in all that time, and he was denied that on the hopes that Kevin Smith was going to get back to him, but he never did, and he just decided he he was done with this. He was typical Hollywood, and he just wanted nothing to do with it. So that ended up delaying it even more. It pushed the release date beyond 2001 so that Kevin Smith could work on his fifth View Askew film, which would end up becoming Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Gregory McDonald's manager, David List, it suggested that Ryan Reynolds could probably play the role very well because he had seen Ryan Reynolds play Van Wilder essentially by channeling Chevy Chase for his performance there. He thought he could nail the Chevy Chase role. After inquiring independently, 
David List was shot down by Ryan Reynolds about the idea because Ryan Reynolds said that he couldn't do it because the role was too iconic as Chevy Chase and it was comedy hallowed ground to him. He thought that it was just never going to be as satisfying to the fans of Fletch like him. Several stars did petition Kevin Smith for the role, though. That included Matthew Perry, John Cusack, Jay Moore, Chris Rock, and a few others. Kevin Smith eventually settled on putting Jason Lee back in the lead role. He stated that he would not make the film at all if Jason Lee was not the star. Even so, by 2003, Harvey Weinstein, who felt that Jason Lee just really did not have box office appeal, as evidenced by being in box office bombs in anything that he appeared in outside of Kevin Smith's films. Kevin Smith's films did not make a lot of money anyway, but they were cheap, at least to make. Harvey Weinstein, in the meantime, courted other actors to try to appear in the film. Will Smith, Brad Pitt, Adam Sandler, Jimmy Fallon. He ultimately did make Ben Affleck, which was Kevin Smith's other alternate choice, an offer of $10 million to play the part of Fletch, and it seemed like a done deal at that point. They even had a production office. They had started scouting for locations, but the project still ended up meandering, and eventually Ben Affleck decided he was not interested in playing the role after all. Kevin Smith insisted... Jason Lee, he's still viable. He would work for a fraction of what Ben Affleck was asking for. And every single time he offered it out there to Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein repeatedly shot it down. By 2005, you can see this is creeping up more and more, the Weinsteins ended up splitting from Disney to form a new studio. That was the Weinstein Company. It retained the Fletch rights. And despite saying that he would be out of the project if Jason Lee were not Fletch, Weinstein opened up Kevin Smith to look at other possible actors, suggesting that Zach Braff, who was a hot comedic actor after the success of Garden State, he could be playing the part. Kevin Smith was skeptical about the fit with Zach Braff, but he did really like the suggestion he heard from someone else of Dave Chappelle. Weinstein, though, disregarded the Chappelle choice because Chappelle did not have name recognition and he was not going to be very popular in overseas markets. Ellen DeGeneres was even floated out there as a possible gender-flipping possibility, but Weinstein didn't think that that would work either. The clock on the Weinstein company rights were ticking down. They were set to expire in 2006. They ended up asking Kevin Smith one more time, are you interested in making the film their way? He replied he would not do it without Jason Lee once again, which they found unacceptable given that he was not a big enough star. So Smith quit. David List, who was Gregory McDonald's manager, immediately cut off Kevin Smith from the project entirely, saying that was obviously a dead end. They quickly moved on to another creator, self-proclaimed Fletch fan Bill Lawrence as a director. Bill Lawrence created the TV show Scrubs, and he had great success with Zach Braff as the star of Scrubs. Thought that that was a match made in heaven. Fletch One would have marked Lawrence's debut as a feature film director. Unfortunately, Zach Braff began to have cold feet. He had doubts as to whether he could pull off the role. He thought it would be a career killer if the fans would not accept him. And he felt that anyone other than Chevy Chase was probably not going to be accepted. So Weinstein, he still loved Lawrence's script. He ended up shopping around to other actors. He returned to Ryan Reynolds. Of course, he got shot down there. Justin Long, John Krasinski, several others, all of whom passed. No one was biting. Eventually, Bill Lawrence removed himself from consideration, feeling like it just was never going to fly. He needed to concentrate more on his TV show, so he pulled himself out of the running as the director. And by this point, the rights were extended by Weinstein year by year, even dabbling to make a cheap Fletch film just to keep the rights long enough for another five years to make the movie they ultimately wanted. Kevin Smith, hearing about them wanting to make a cheap version of Fletch, he jockeyed once again to make the low-budget Fletch film with Jason Lee because Jason Lee was not a big star. He, he could make that film for like a million or two million dollars just to show how it could be done. But Weinstein did not want to be shown up by Kevin Smith by making a successful Fletch film with Jason Lee. So they instead offered it to Joshua Jackson with Steve Pink as the director for the cheapy film. That did not last long, however. Weinstein decided they wanted to retool the script with other writers, including David List's suggestion of Harry Stein to write this new screenplay. It was completed by 2009, but Weinstein was still less than thrilled with what he was receiving. But it was, after all of that, a moot issue. Weinstein was contacted by one of his lawyers that the rights had already reverted back to the McDonald estate upon his death in 2008, and that effectively killed the project once and for all in Weinstein's care. So... By 2011, things would pick up again when Warner Brothers and the production studio Anonymous Content picked up the rights to the Fletch properties. They cycled through a number of screenplays from different writers, including Seinfeld writer and Curb Your Enthusiasm producer David Mandel. 
none of them to their liking. In 2013, David List would end up offering his own screenplay draft, which he used to lure in Jason Sudeikis as a potential lead, which Warner Brothers did accept. They ended up starting to look for a director for this new Fletch project. In 2014, Sudeikis officially signed on to play Fletch. Anonymous content stayed on as producers, but by 2015, Warner Brothers effectively gave up on making Fletch. So the project was given to Relativity, with Sudeikis still a go, but it still has yet to find traction. And as of today, in 2019, in October, they are still looking for a director for this project. So with time running down on the rights again, will Fletch ever get made? We don't know, at least as of this point. Maybe by the time you're listening to this, if you're listening to this many years from now, you know the answer to where it went after this. But as of right now, it's still in production hell, and it has been for a long time. At least we still have the original Fletch films to entertain us in the meantime. So thank you so much for indulging me on this bit of, I guess, history here. I hope you found it interesting enough to stick with it to this point. Next week's show, by the way, we're going to continue on with the third and the final of the comedy Masters of Disguise. Going off of a film that very much borrows somewhat from Fletch by having somebody don a lot of different disguises, and I think it borrows a lot from the Pink Panther films as well. It is from 1989, just like Fletch lives. It is called Who's Harry Crumb? And that features John Candy in the main role from 1989 for next week's episode. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the review. Go to quipster.net if you want to contact me. You have anything you want to say, links to my Twitter feed, Facebook page, Instagram. Until next week, thanks, everyone, for joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies. 